Madam Secretary, most esteemed members of the Motivate Committee, most honored guests. As public servants, is it who we work for or what we work toward that matters most? It's Saturday, and you're down at Cape Henlopen State Park on one fine, crystal clear, 82 degree summer day, enjoying the sights and sounds of the beach. You squint at something. They're moving on the sand near the surf and realize it's a sea creature, and on closer inspection, it's a helplessly flopping baby dolphin. What would you do? You might go find help at the guard shack, then try calling the local Denrec office, maybe dig a shallow pool and fill it with seawater to keep the baby wet until help arrived. You might stick around to make sure that the youngling gets released safely back into the water, then celebrate the goodness and kindness of all involved, and maybe even get your 15 seconds of fame in a WBOC TV interview. <laughs> Flip to Monday, and you're having an okay day at work, grinding it out, getting stuff done. You peer into your email, and you see a request for a Vera desk. You know, one of those desktops that raises and lowers so the user can work standing up to relieve chronic back pain and help with circulation. After a quick check of the stock room, you fire back an email that there aren't any in stock. Oh, it's the end of the fiscal year, so you can't order one. And you think the supplier's changing style, so a new model needs to be selected and procured. It might take a few months. You'll be in touch. What's going on here? Both situations feature a relatively helpless individual who needs something from you. In the former, you create a path to solve the problem. In the latter, you're not even willing to try. Why? Let me propose that in the case of the dolphin, your creative problem-solving juices were flowing and you, could, you were totally stoked to intervene on behalf of that creature and get it back to its habitat. You could all but taste the success. In the case of your coworker's desk request, you let the supply process that's in place dictate the outcome. And shoot, that person doesn't need that desk right away. They won't die without it. So as public servants, is it who we work for or what we work toward that matters most? Now you might have every official and appropriate reason for your email response. There are rules after all. But by not supplying the requested item in a timely fashion or proposing an alternative solution, you've entered into an adversarial relationship with your customer. Congratulations, you're the enemy. <laughs> Why should we care? Have you ever been a customer? Have you ever waited in line or in a doctor's office or on hold? Check out this moody clip from Meet the Parents. Enjoy your flight, then. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. We're only boarding rows nine and above right now. You'll have to wait. Well, I'm in row eight. Please step aside, sir. It's just one row. I don't you think it's okay, but... We'll call your room momentarily. Step aside, sir. the time and resources, it feels like disrespect. But good news, we as public service can do something about that for the people we serve. And it starts with identifying waste in processes. What is waste? 
any part of the process that doesn't add value for your customer or something your customer is not willing to pay for. There are typically eight accepted waste definitions with catchy acronyms like downtime, defects, overproduction, waiting, non-utilized talent, transportation inventory motion, excessive processing. What is value? Any output of your process that your customer is willing to pay for. In our desk scenario, the waste identified would be waiting, transportation, non-utilized talent, and maybe even defective production. The value is the desk. Let's get back to there are rules. But consider, do you understand the why behind the current process? Is it based on regulation, GPS tradition, a former employee's whim because your boss said so? Is that just the way we've always done things? Is there room for improvement? You start by stepping into your customer's shoes, supplying the needed item in the most efficient way possible, and before you know it, excellence is being delivered. Congratulations, you've become the hero. And as we know, not all heroes wear capes. People like you and me on the front line are the most untapped resource for providing solutions and identifying waste. Now please understand, I'm not advocating throwing off all constraints and abandoning former practices. The reality is, there are constraints. Sometimes there really are rules. And it's equally true that creativity thrives under constraints. For example, much of the famous art created during the Renaissance was commissioned under contracts that dictated many of the crucial details, including colors, materials, sizes, deadlines, budgets. The true beauty of continuous improvement is you're making incremental changes that whittle down waste and increase value. Toyota executive Taki Ono is credited with formalizing and applying these concepts known as lean. Lean and continuous improvement say it's okay to experiment, it's okay to fail. Risk taking, in fact, inspires confidence. Though his successes were well known, Thomas Edison knew failure frequently and famously said, we haven't failed, we now know a thousand things that won't work, so we're that much closer to finding what will. Accepting the small risk to make changes can pay abundant dividends, leading to successes both small and large. Most importantly, the freedom to take risks taps into the creativity and underutilized talent of the marvelous people who have been carefully selected to work here. So it's a win, win, win. Happy customer, confident, satisfied, and engaged employees, and a more nimble organization that's even more open to innovation while striving for excellence. With continuous improvement, are we going for perfection? Yes. Will we ever achieve it? No. We're imperfect people living in an imperfect world. Some waste is inevitable at times. But again, is it who we work for or what we work toward that matters most? So what's it going to take to make this culture change to inspire excellence? Will high-level sponsors buy in with their support and remove barriers to innovation on the front line? Should it take six months to get a piece of office equipment? Some of my coworkers laugh it off and say, ha, welcome to Dell Dot. That response speaks volumes and honestly exasperates me as the customer. I believe we can do better. There's definitely room for improvement in that process. So, as public servants, is it who we work for or what we work toward that matters most? It's a trick question because it's both. If we're working toward excellence, then we're working for our customers in the best way possible. Eliminating waste, using continuous improvement, that's where excellence and innovation happen.